just the wrong way. Yeah. Then one. Yeah. Can you hear me? Okay. Good afternoon. Um, thanks everyone who joined this event. Um, let me to introduce uh, uh, the panel. I want also to thank the, the organizer, the staff who were very kind. And um, just to present the panel, a couple of words to present this panel uh, that comes from an idea of uh, China Media Observatory. It was the privilege to join for the first time this. Uh... Oh, so probably. Like this, is better? Closer. Closer? Can you hear me? Okay, <laughs> better? So, so the structure of this event will be based basically on four presentations, no more than uh, 20 minutes each, so we can leave the last part of uh, the, the panel to the Q&A. And uh, we will start with Yejin, a colleague from uh, Coburn University, who has been working for uh, uh, two prominent uh, um, Chinese uh, um, media outlets that are the CCTV, the most important television, and uh, Phoenix TV. And she's, she has be also been um, a lecturer for the Zhejiang University in media and communication. So let's start to broke the ice with her, her, her presentation. Thank you, Eugene. Is it okay for the microphone? Yeah? Okay, right. 
Um, good afternoon, everyone. I'm very honored to be invited to present my research here. Um, what I would like to talk about uh, this afternoon is the journalistic professionalism dilemmas in China under social media challenges. Um, I think after 30 years importing from the West, the journalist professionalism in China nowadays return to the center and uh, obtain higher attention from scholars. So the traditional journalist profession we all know is originally from the United States. And uh, it may well know ethical norms. I think include objectivity, balanced reports, and pursuit of the truth. But in China, when Judy Pollan in 1990s analyzed how the social reforms were allowing journalists in PRC to be aspiring professionals and becoming the first academic to introduce a norm into China. The argument about how to localizing the journalist professionalism in China has never been ended. So uh, no matter what expector, it uh, could be another term with Chinese characteristic or its ongoing ex existing gap between the journalists and the scholars. But I think in China, uh, they did take Western modern journalist professionalism principle as one of the reflecting mirrors in their everyday news activities. Um, however, I think the rise of digital media and globalizing trend brought new challenges to journalists and news organizations. As we all know, in China, is one of the most uh, users who use the social media, and the figure is um, up every day. So, um, if we describe it as two side sort, the user general contact, in time feedbacks, accuracy in checking is one side, while the net violence and online immoral behaviors and false news, irrational quarrel is the other. So my research will employ the discourse analysis, news production process review, and in-depth interviews. In the case of a news report about Charlie Magazine in France on China, uh, China Central uh, Television, uh, which happened in January 2015, to analyze how professional journalist practice were challenged by the involvement of the social media and uh, how those challenges pose new questions to the genetic ethics and principle in China. So as a start, it might be useful to uh, sketch a historical map of the development of the JP in China within a broader social transformation as a background for my research. So I would describe into three approaches. The first one is I call it a case study-oriented approach, uh, who is delivered by Professor Guo Zhengzhi from Tsinghua University. She um, think, she argued in his paper that Western model of professionalism could be found as a theoretical pivot to a news programs. So apparently, to some extent, the starting point of importing journalistic professionalism in China had a kind of its dramatical uh, fun functions. But this case study oriented research framework is also employed as a main approach to analyze the localization of the professionalism in some specific China journalistic practice. And the second one I uh, mentioned is the historical approach, like Michael Scoosh in 2001. He uh, explained why objectivity rise as a normal, firstly, and most fully discussed in the US. Uh, the third one, um, but very uh, important one, is empirical approach, uh, which is developed by Professor Pan Zhongdang and his colleagues, who argued that professionalism is an ideology that fragmented in China journalism. So with very quick uh, review of these three approach, my aim is try to uh, deliver the three different approach to contextualize the turn and show a clear clue to my methodologies. And as you see, the three different scholars, their interpretation interpretation of the professionalism 
uh, demonstrate the complicated process of articulation in define, define professionalism and linking this idea system with historical conditions through situated social practice. Okay, uh, let's move to the case study. Um, this object of the research is CCTV news cover or Shelley Hodu terrorist attack to examine Janice's use of its discursive compass as take professionalism as a model when they devising, carrying out, and interpreting their own practice. As you can see, in the last 10 years, the rapid expanding market force leads to the collapse of the hegemony of the CCTV, the biggest national media in China, and uh, with the flourishing entertainment program around the country, I think uh, the three of this television show is also very popular in the European country, like uh, China Got Talent, I'm the singer, and the voice of China. Uh, split broadcast in the Zhejiang, Hunan, and Jiangsu province. So the CCTV no, uh, has to compete with these three and other past little brothers, but get even more burden to attract youth audience from social media. And another one we should mention is CCTV expand many more foreign correspondent branch station to different countries. They hope to spread influence on international breaking news reporters. So I would like to uh, show you the questions in my case study would like to ask and also try to answer the first one, how social media contextualize journalistic professionalism, as we talked before. And the second one, is there any new character of ethical attitudes and proceed practice in this very specific case study? You can see there are two um, photographers I cut from the website show these two news reporters by the CCTV. The first one, the first news report broadcast at around 7.20 in the morning news. It's the right one, yes. On CCTV in uh, January the 11th. It's already three days later after, you know, the terrorist attack. So the reporters produced as an in-depth program, which obviously met the news value, and no one argued about this news report. But uh, the turning point of the event happened in the left one is a blogger which is posted on the deputy um, chief editor of the finance magazine in China. And he described the event by said he uh, got an email from his college classmate Wang Fanghui and Wang explained he was the witness of this attack in France, and even face to face to meet the terrorists. Uh, fortunately, they didn't get hurt, so they called the police afterwards. Uh, and uh, the next day, they accepted the French television uh, interview. But when the CTV reporters approached him and expressed a wish to interview him, he agreed. Um, when he watched the report on CCTV, which is this one, uh, he refused, he said, it's disappointing him, because uh, um, he said, um, in this leader of the news, that today we interview a special Chinese witness. After track, he refused to the interview, only knowing the two terrorists were shot dead. He finally eased his anxiety and agreed to accept our exclusive interview. It's not true, one said, because um, he says the reporter destroy his mental construction after, after the terrorist even ruin his reputation. When these bloggers reposted on a, a Xinlang microburger in finance magazine, uh, yes, Xinlang microburger, several later, hours later, we have already 15,000 reports 
and about 4,000 comments. So that's a lot. Most of which criticize the reporter, even have many personal attacks. Some also listed the previous report accident of CCTV and uh, also, many scholars question the reporter's professional literacy. So instead of uh, answering back on the social media platform, the reporter chose to interview Wang Fanghui again, is it this one, and uh, on the date of the French national match in Paris to invite him to express his courage to overcome the fear of the violence and move on to a new life when it is the reason he chose to accept the interview in the, in the first report. This is the quotation from my interview with the reporter. And however, another blog posted on the Zhang Jing's uh, Brogger and explain their second meeting or also point out his question of the second report. He said his interview was fragmented by the main story of the French National March and his first interview with the French television news channel didn't mention properly in the first report. So, uh, in interesting, this report on the magazine, uh, Michael Brogger, however, didn't get so many attentions as the last one. Okay, uh, quickly uh, review the whole news production distribution of this event. I would like to say, because um, we all know in the social media scenario, especially in this case, more social actors joined news production in college. As we can see in this case, interviewee, also we can, we can call it quizzy, participant journalist, audience or netizens, fact tractors, fellow journalists and competitors. Also, we call it social media commenters, alternative news resource as well. So, so many actors play in this uh, diverse roles and uh, very active in the process. Also, they switch from uh, one role to another among the different identity as well. So which certainly is not the same in the traditional media, but social media environment interwaved with market forces, party state controlling power in China have complicated the Chinese genius in prying the professionalism with new possibilities. Let me first bring forward new challenges in the sense of background and uh, factor checking. Uh, this correspondent actually misjudged in the first place by identity her report as being exclusive, which obviously is not, because the one who found way already uh, get interview uh, before for uh, French television. But uh, as the correspondent said in my interview, face to face, he, she said, I presume Wong's previous interview in the French television, just two minutes, and, and it's not a deep investigation, doesn't reveal many details. Uh, but we, at CCTV, took more than 14 minutes to one to one interview and add more details and provide broader context to the reporters. So in this sense, she thinks it could be called an exc uh, exclusive interview and report. It might sound like radical games, but deeply, I think, for these uh, reporters, clearly, these reporters, exclusive reporter pressures on the multi challenge from other media, uh, in time, rowing reporters on the web and social media, as, as well as international news agencies in competition. Uh, is, is the problem. So how to explore further details uh, is, is her first important task. So this is the first one I would like to say. The second one is, I think the second contention is if she is explained about timing and the reason of one's accepting the view. The correspondent intention was contextualized report with a very late event, as they said in the news leading, and made a sort of assumption, however, is not accepted by the interviewee. So with the self-consciousness of his own right, become much more stronger, and in time, it actually is easier to attachable by using social media, as Wang Fanghui write an email to you know, the deputy editor of the very famous magazine, finance magazine in China. In this way, actually, its objectivity is a principle become hard to keep, but there's actually much 
urgent to follow. So the last one I would like to say is might be problematically in this report is balancing. Uh, it's, it might understandable why correspondent choose one as his only interview in his report because he's Chinese, uh, he is very talkative, and he's very close to, you know, in the culture accountability. However, nowadays the audience have infiltrated in the social media for a long time, so um, the multi sources even alternative voice would be better. So in this case, I think, because Wang Fanghui has his colleague, uh, maybe the, the uh, correspondent should uh, interview him as well, and as a balance and a complementary side to this reporter, which might not be, uh, have this bad effect. So during my interview of the correspondent in CGTV European branch, uh, not this, just this case study, also other case studies. The journalistic professionalism still is one of the highly mentioned word for these reporters, especially, you know, they are the ones who in the frontiers to compete with other one-class, bigger and international federal journalists. How to um, re-articulate their own model or the Chinese model of the journalist professionalism still the one big issue for them in every day's uh, practice. So um, I know now for CGTV, they already have uh, one very general guide to the journalist how to handle, how to uh, public or broadcast your news on the social media. But for them, it's not enough. They still have to take situated action because of the viability and unpredictability. So as a conclusion, I would like to deliver the first questions in these uh, researches, which is, how the contemporary intellectual journalists shape their subjectivities through floating social media, and how could they look out themselves in the dynamic and transition China? I would like to uh, maybe brought just one possibility to do these further studies as a ph philosophical approach, uh, a quote from the philosophy Foucault, and he said, um, use the technology of the self could transform them in order to attain a certain state of happiness and pure, purity, wisdom and uh, perfection might could provide a philosophy framework to reflect further on this uh, study or on this research. Okay, that's all. Thank you. Thank you for listening. And I will deliver to my, uh, to my friend, the next speaker, Gigi, who is from the <laughs> University of Lugano and also a PhD candidate uh, of faculty of uh, communication science. Uh, now he, uh, he worked in China Media Observatory and he was a freelance journalist for many Italy magazines and newspapers. So, please welcome. I can use this one, it's better. Good afternoon again. Um, what I'm going to do during these next uh, 15, 20 minutes is just to um, provide a kind of um, description and um, um, try to explain which kind of relationship there is between traditional media, Chinese traditional media, and new media. 
So um, I decided to start to d divide my, 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 my presentation in four parts. The first would be probably a little bit boring because there I just, I, I think, but I don't, nevertheless, I think it's quite important to provide some uh, data about uh, the size of uh, Chinese media press, so ch Chinese media system in general. The second one is just um, a series of data about uh, um, the, 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 the usage of uh, Chinese uh, media companies and uh, social networks, both Chinese ones and Western ones. And then I also would like to show you a couple of case studies. Uh, I mean, totally there are four case studies. Um, the first group will try to uh, show you uh, the, the first steps of uh, these big Chinese companies who try to invest uh, on new media. And then in this, this case study should be considered a little bit uh, not very successful. And how they ch how this media company change had been changing this behavior, especially toward the international audience. So let's start with the, some data collected after the publication of the uh, Chinese Journalist Association, which was published uh, in December 2014, and which in the, this, this report informs us that there are almost 2,000 um, newspapers in China with a circulation of almost 50 million copies. It's, of course, a terrific number, as you can see. On the other hand, it's quite important that the, even though during the last 25 years uh, there have been an impressive economic development, on the other hand, the role of party newspapers is, is, still, very active, is still very present with more than 400 party newspapers. It could be considered a kind of small contradiction, but uh, um, it counts, and it count, these, these sites count not only in China, but also outside, outside Chinese borders. Indeed, one other, another report published by a well-known World Association of Newspapers and News Publisher group uh, informs us that uh, the 20% of the most well-known newspapers around the world, I mean, with the most important relevance around the world, are based in China. So what this means? What does it mean? It means that Chinese newspapers are beginning to have influence also outside Chinese borders. And this could be considered a kind of contradiction because on one hand, uh, if on one hand there is still a quite significant presence of party newspapers in the market, on the other hand, the role of the, of the most of this, of the, the most of this newspaper, of, uh, um, based and uh, are, are oriented to economic economic goals. But th this kind of growth has been, of course, uh, uh, supported by the role of new media. It's something not new. As we know, uh, China Internet uh, began to develop its uh, structure a little bit later than uh, Western. Uh, countries. Indeed, um, it was uh, at, inter at international level, the Chinese internet was recognized all, uh, um, at, the, at the end, at the beginning of uh, uh, the 90s. On the other hand, so it, 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 the, the development started with a huge gap to fill, especially if compared with uh, other Western countries. But on the other hand, this gap was squeezed and still, as prob probably was completely um, um, sold during the year. Indeed, uh, already in the mid of 90s, CCTV, which is the most important, is the national television, started to broadcast its services, its, its programs online. But also, uh, the most prominent uh, Chinese, the most important Chinese uh, uh, news agencies, that is Xinhua, and uh, People's Daily, start to um, uh, publish online their, um, their, their, their news. This kind of development should be considered extremely impressive if you consider the situation nowadays. Indeed, um, there are at the present stage, I mean at the present stage, by the end of 2013, there were more than uh, almost 350 million subscribers, internet subscribers, to use uh, news app to uh, access uh, online con to, uh, to access online content and, and news. Moreover, a 
according to the last data published by the China, in Chi China Internet Information Network Center, the role of mobile internet is extremely important nowadays. Indeed, it overtook the PC, the PC ones. So it's absolutely, according to me, according to also the other uh, scholars, this data should be very important. It, it, it counts a lot because uh, even though China, even though internet in China arrived a little bit later, at the present stage, the, the internet infrastructure is very, very, probably much more developed than other countries. So, I, during the last week, I also want to uh, analyze, I, 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 collect, sorry, I collected some data in order to analyze which kind of use uh, these big, the two, two of the big, three of the biggest co um, Chinese comp media companies have. And as we know, most of Western uh, uh, social network services are censored in China. Facebook, Twitter, YouTube are not accessible. On the other hand, uh, this situation led Chinese government to set up a national in internet industry, which has in uh, Sina Weibo, the microblog platform, and WeChat, the mobile application like uh, WhatsApp, the two most important, two of the most important uh, social network services. So we can know that uh, even though the, 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 these services were open, especially the uh, microblog platform was open less than five years ago, they already can, they, they can, they already have a lot, million of uh, subscribers. Unfortunately, I have not the chance to collect. Uh, uh, the, 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 the number of subscribers on, uh, um, on uh, the mobile application, but still is very present. And what is interesting here is that these media companies even try to invest some dedicated platforms during the time. So this was the case of uh, Xinhua, the press agency, and uh, People's Daily, the most uh, uh, important, because it's considered the most piece of the um, of, the, um, of the Communist Party. They open a search engine. Let's let, let, let imagine like uh, Republica or New York Times or The Guardian open a search engine in order to face uh, Google. That, that happened in China. And, but this, this, this uh, solution was not very successful. So that's why they combined together this kind of search engine in order to uh, uh, provide uh, a better service. Nevertheless, the results of this project were very, uh, how can I say, very far from the original goal. Indeed, is not very used. And the same situation, the same mistake, I would say, is present for the microblog platform. Both Xinhua and uh, um, uh, People's Daily tried, some, uh, tried to open, to develop um, some dedicated microblog platform. Again, in this case, also in this case, the, 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 um, the market uh, feedback was very, very low. During the time, they learned a lesson, they start to use the other Chinese services, and uh, let's say that uh, the results were, were quite successful. So they learned from this kind of mistake. At the same time, they opened some uh, page on Chinese web, uh, social networks written in English that was aimed in order to get some Western, especially English speak speaker, readerships and audience. But as we can see, the result is, again, not and it shouldn't be considered very successful. So what happened during the last years? During the last years, all these three big companies opened some Western profiles. So we can see Twitter, People's Daily, and CCT New all have a Twitter, Facebook, and YouTube channel. What is impressive here is that uh, uh, the, the, the goal reached by Xinhua was uh, one point, more than 1.5 million followers on its um, Twitter profile. It means that something is changing. Chinese media system in general, well, at least the three most important um, media outlets, media companies, are trying to invest in more uh, outside Chinese border. And uh, this is important, these results are important not only from an economic and a technical point of view. These are probably even more important if 
we take in consideration also the role of political in political conglomeration that is taking place during the last year. During the last year. Probably some of you already heard about this World Media Summit. It's a summit which took place the first time uh, in uh, Beijing in 2009. And it's very important because it was actually organized by Xinhua, which is the uh, party press agency. But it also involved more than 100 media companies all around the world. Uh, some of these names are quite important, like a a Associated Press, BBC, NBC, New York Times, and so on. The role of Xinhua is considered relevant indeed. Uh, using the, wor the words of the former president of Xinhua, President Li Zong, uh, Li Zong Jun, uh, this uh, media summit is aimed and is addressed to establish a, new, a, a productive dialogue between China media companies and the biggest Western ones. The final goal of this event like this is to promote Taiwan Zhuang to enforce the uh, propaganda outside the Chinese borders. And this is not important not only for the world, world uh, for, for media companies in general. Probably this, this kind of strategy, if associated to the role of uh, um, the Chinese internet governance is probably even more important. Another event which confirms this trend took place in uh, Wuzhen, a small village in uh, southern China, in uh, December 2014. This is for the first time. This is called the World Internet Conference. And also in this case, it was quite interesting to see the presence of some big companies like Facebook, which I remind you is uh, uh, censored in China, and uh, other, um, other big companies such as Google, Ama Google, and Amaz uh, Google, Amazon, and Apple. They start to elaborate a, a dialogue with uh, not only with other big uh, Chinese companies, but also with the Chinese government. And it's quite important, it is also quite important to remind that uh, even Twitter, less than two weeks ago, opened his representative office in Hong Kong in order to support uh, uh, Chinese companies to promote their services also within Chinese, uh, also within Western, Western um, uh, social website, uh, social networks. So, to conclude, this is just uh, this series, uh, this set series of um, experience provided by Chinese media companies in general uh, should let us think that. Uh, Chinese media system in changing. And uh, it's during the last year, China is trying to uh, establish, is trying to enforce its position as leader in terms of media system at international level. And all the, the collection of these events should probably confirm that the professionalism of this uh, big corporation is going to increase during the during the next future, that's it. I'll be almost so boring for you. So I just leave the uh, please, the, the word to uh, my colleague Jan Jan, who is also a PhD candidate at the Università della Svizzera Italiana, and she also work for works for um, the China Media Observatory. She's going to present her uh, PhD project uh, next week, so almost finished. And she's be also been working for uh, CCTV, the Ch Ch uh, Chinese national television, but also she had experience uh, as for, um, supported the foreign correspondent at the Independent when she was based in China. Thanks, Gigi, and thanks everyone for uh, joining our panel. I'm here to share with you some of my findings with part of my PhD project. And today I will talk about uh, foreign correspondence news practice in China. As you may know, many scholars has, have been argued that the location of a country in the world system will determine how easy the country will access international news flow, as well as how the country will receive international news coverage. 
so the more important the country is as those core countries, they will be much easier than other countries to access both international news flow as well as rec receive coverage. So in this case, with the uh, consolidation of China's economic power in the past three decades, as well as China's role played in the world geopolitics and international society, China starts to become one of the more important in the world system. And at the same time, China also starts to receive different news coverage from different news outlets uh, more, much more frequently in recent years. But on another hand, um, how about those foreign correspondents who wrote, who produced those news stories about China? How, how, how is their situation working in China there? Uh, it seems something different. Uh, till now, according to the data published in 2013, now in total there are more than 400 foreign media organizations open their branches in China, and more than 700 journalists are working there. And you can see here uh, the Foreign Correspondent Club of China. They uh, gathered like 200, 243 correspondents uh, from 31 countries, and many they were from European countries as well as North America. And starting from 2008, FCCC started to publish uh, an annual report regarding to the working condition of those foreign correspondents working in China every year. And what I want to highlight here is actually uh, before the Olympic Games, uh, the Chinese government made a big step to open to foreign uh, news organizations. Uh, and also the first regulation concerning their news practices were published in China in 2007 and put into practice in 2008. What does it mean? Before the Olympic, actually, foreign correspondents, they were even not allowed to travel freely in China. They need to get a kind of permission from local authority if they want to go someplace in, inside China to do interviews. But after 2008, after this regulation published it, Till nowadays, foreign correspondents can go freely to anywhere, well, except Tibet, uh, to go everywhere to report and also to talk to those one who are content to talk to them. So this actually gives them much more freedom after the Olympic. But if we look at the latest report published by FCCC in 2014, seems their working conditions still remain quite difficult. You can see from here, like 80% of those surveyed correspondents saw their working condition worsened or stayed the same comparing to the year before. And almost all of them did not think the reporting condition in China meets international standards. And also there is a kind of increase of the threats or interruption they will receive from the Chinese authority. So on one hand, it's the super increase of the news amount, the news coverage about China from different news organizations from the world. But on another hand, their working condition seems did not really improve so much. And this contradiction actually pushed me to look at this case and to understand really um, what the real condition is for those correspondents working in China. So my theoretical framework were basically from these uh, three uh, theories, and especially when I look at uh, the, the, the literature reviews about how China was shown in international news coverage, I discovered many research were focusing on content analysis of the media outlets. Not so many, absolutely, ab almost no study really look at the news practice, look at the correspondence, those content producers aspect. So, um, and this is why I start to, to, uh, to look at this, this issue. And th these are my three main questions. Basically, they were about uh, the up-to-date working situation, and how the process of the news making look like, and also the challenges and the limitations. In order to answer those questions, I, I tried to work with, uh, with two correspondents for 13 months in China. And, and this hands-on experience gave me both the first-hand understanding of their 
uh, news making process, as well as it helped me to establish a network with many different foreign correspondents in China, as well as their news assistants. So after that, I, uh, I finished my in-depth interviews with 20 correspondents, as well as quite 40 news assistants to, to show you the findings um, today. So the first important funding of this research is about this invisible assistant group. Uh, according to my interview, um, most of the journalists, they need a um, news assistant in China. Even for those one who can speak some Chinese, but they still need an assistant to finish interviews. Uh, basically, uh, the difficulty comes from the Chinese language. As you may understand, it's quite complicated for foreigners to really know how to master this language. And uh, I remember only one correspondent, he doesn't need any assistant, but because he is a Chinese overseas, so he can speak Chinese quite natively and he understands the whole context of the, of the society. And another reason is um, the culture discount. For a correspondent, especially for those one who just arrived in China, it's difficult, that for, difficult for them to understand everything in a very short time. So they need someone to make introduction for them in different news stories and to dig out different backgrounds regarding to different stories. But who are those assistants and how reliable are they? Uh, according to my understanding and my network there in China, most of those news assistants, they were young graduates from university. Most of them, they were like between 22 to 30 years old, so it's a very young group of people. And they, uh, most of them, they were studying in foreign language be, uh, before, even not in journalism. And also because there is this lack of professional training before they start to work, mostly once they were hired by the correspondents, they need to immediately play a very important role for this news organization in China. And also this is a group with a very huge mobility. Very few of, the, of them will work for a long time for one journalist in one media organization. Most of them will change their job quite frequently, either from one media to another media, either they just give up to work as a news assistant. Um, and the second funding is, um, is about the news making process. Uh, if we look at the decision making of the news topics um, those journalists choose to, to, to report about China, we can see they actually enjoy uh, quite uh, freedom to, to choose the topic they like. The editorial uh, board oversee will have very little impact on those journalists to make decision to, uh, to choose their new subject. And also the news assistant contributes also quite limited to the new subject. But about the interview part, although still like 60% of interviews will be done by the correspondents together with the assistants, but still there were like 30% of interviews, according to my interviews, uh, they were done by the assistant themselves. So again, if the assistant group is so young, they do not have so long time professional training, and if they serve the journalists in the way that they think their boss may like, they will limit the information to the, to the journalist in the end. They play like the first filter for the information about China. So this group become even more important according to my findings. Uh, here is uh, uh, a picture to show you the new resources used by both correspondents and by news assistants. Basically, they use more or less the same, and the correspondents will use more Western sources, uh, other media stories, and especially from uh, Western news agencies. And the Chinese assistant will look at more about Chinese sources, and especially uh, about Chinese social media content. And also the, the, last, uh, the last one, the last source, I call it a direct source from petitioners. This is a very interesting group of people. They were Chinese and they had their some kind of problem with the local government or with some authority. And they will find the assistant to 
cover their stories. I remember when I was working there, almost every day I would receive either phone call or email from someone who was telling me their sad stories and they want to uh, want our, I mean, us to follow their stories. So in this way to help them to get attention from the local government and help them to even get, in some cases, to get some money they lost. And here is uh, the map of the whole process of news making. Uh, the red line is the work done by the correspondents and the blue line is about the uh, contribution made by the news assistant. So from here you can see almost all the steps were assisted by those news assistants till the uh, journalists start to wrap up the story. Um, so this process also proved me again how important this, this invisible group of people are uh, doing their job there. And because most, mostly they cannot sign up their names in the story, so I think nobody could read like their, their contribution in the news outlets. And the third funding is about uh, the gap between foreign correspondents and the Chinese source. It's not so easy to make interviews in China, if, especially if, if foreign correspondents go to uh, cities or towns not like Beijing or Shanghai, not, go, not this kind of international city. If they go the inner side of China, you may find people, want, people do not want to talk to you. Why? <laughs> because there's also a very widespread stereotypes in Chinese mind that Western foreign media, especially Western media, they are bad guys because they always talk about bad stories about us and it's better not to talk to them. So they have these stereotypes and, and, and when you, when even you are not going to talk about any sensitive topic, you will find people, well, they, they, they really do not want to, um, yeah, help you or help you to understand better the situation. And especially if the topic itself is sensitive, is somehow politic related, it's even more difficult. And also, if some people talk to you, they will ask you not to include their names or affiliations in the news uh, outlets. But if you remember the picture I showed you before, for those group of people who had problems with the government, they want to talk to you and they want to offer all their details of their personal life because they want to be exposured. And so this actually puts the situation of both the correspondents and news assistants very embarrassed because they actually, most of the correspondents, especially those responsible ones, they want to present a balanced picture of China to the outside world. They are not only going there to say bad words about China, but the only one they could find to talk to them, they were someone had problems. So it's not easy for them to gain a real balanced public opinion about China from Chinese citizens. On another hand, with the Chinese government, according to my interview, you can see the graph here, most of the journalists, they do not think uh, the relationship with the government improved in the recent years. Even my findings is a little bit more optimistic than the FCCC report, but still the majority of the correspondents, they, they, were, yeah, they were quite negative to observe their relationship with the Chinese authorities. And because of the difficulty to make interviews, to get access to public opinion in China, Weibo, this is the Twitter-like platform in China, the social media platform, start to play somehow a role in the foreign news coverage about China. According to my interview, uh, one third of those correspondents, they obtain Weibo account. And well, very few of them use it frequently because it's in Chinese. So only those ones who know Chinese language, they will use this Chinese uh, Twitter. But all the news assistants, they use it very frequently. They check it every day to see whether there are some new, uh, news, new, new things happening, where are some breaking news uh, appear every day. And also both this group, they agreed that uh, Weibo can be uh, a source for news topics and also they can, they can use it as a, a source of comments. I remember the journalist from Wall Street Journal had told me, especially for those verified accounts, those people who registered Weibo with their real name and affiliate, 
affiliation. Uh, it's, it's, it's for them, it's okay to quote them, like some economists. If the, if, if the expert publish something in their own Weibo account, it's a, it's a source to public. So for the foreign correspondent, they, can, they do not need to make direct face-to-face -face interview if it's difficult for them to reach them. They can just quote what they write in their Weibo account and put into their uh, news article. And this can also somehow help them to access different opinions uh, in China through Weibo. But still, the views about whether Weibo is really changing Chinese society, uh, we can see some journalists think it's, uh, it's changing. Someone thinks it's still uh, too early to say, or oh, maybe not so much. So they have different opinions also on this. So to sum up, um, for correspondence, working situation in China is um, still very much problematic. And also, um, as I mentioned many times, the news assistant group play a real important role in the whole news making process for foreign news reporting in China. But their work needs a double evaluation. Uh, the foreign correspondents enjoy their freedom uh, to report in China because they have very, very loosey uh, control from their editorial command overseas, but they have their limits from Chinese authorities and also Chinese public. And the Twitter-like uh, social media platform somehow helped, helped both the correspondents and the news assistant to, to improve their uh, news coverage, but the impact is still limited. And in the end, this is a picture. If one day someone of you go to China to report, you may encounter. Someone may stop you. But what I want to say now is, um, is actually after I interview so many correspondents, most of them, they still enjoy working there. Why? Because China is such a complexity, such a rich place now to give birth to new stories because it's changing so fast. It has its own layer, different layers of every single thing. So they still enjoy working there. So if one day you go to China, I would suggest to you to be wise to select the right assistant working for you. Be patient, dealing with Chinese public, Chinese authorities. Be brave of all those challenges and then enjoy. And if you need my help, I could help you to find the proper person to assist you to report about China. Thank you. Learn Chinese too. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so I will just introduce uh, our last uh, speaker, Emma Lupano, who is now a postdoc researcher in Milan University. Emma was actually one of the best scholars I know from Italy in journalism studies about China, I think, because hey, she, she personally worked both for Xinhua News Agency and People's Daily as uh, Italian <laughs> yeah, face in the Chinese uh, media organization. So this is quite unique and hope you enjoy her presentation. Good afternoon. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Zanzan, for the presentation. Thank you to the organizers for the excellent organization, actually. Um, OK, I'm going to talk. Tell me if there is anything wrong with the voice. Um, I'm going to present today um, an ongoing project that I've been working on for several years, several years now, actually. It was my PhD project, and now it's, I'm developing it even more with my, in my PhD um, project. Um, I did start working on Chinese freelance journalists because I did have some experiences with uh, Xinhua and People's Daily Online, uh, but I was a freelance journalist in China as well. So I was, not, I was a freelance correspondent, let's say. Uh, so I was interested in understanding what is the reality of Chinese freelancers because this concept was a bit strange to me, and I'll, and I'll explain why. Okay, first of all, uh, freelancers are a neglected group uh, in, the, in the academic world. Uh, nobody, as far as I know, I mean, not nobody, but very, very few scholars are studying freelancers, freelance journalists, um, even in Europe, even in the, in the US, even less in China. I mean, in China, as far as I know, there is nobody actually studying Chinese freelancers. Um, 
nevertheless, the phenomenon of freelancers is, you will probably know, uh, very important at the moment. Uh, the number of freelance journalists in the world has been increasing uh, significantly over the last decade. Um, the European and International Federation of Journalists have data about it. I didn't report the data here, but it's, the figures are increasing. Um, and not just, you know, in countries like Italy or Spain who may have financial problems. The reasons why um, the number of freelance journalists is growing, um, according to the, those few studies that I could find, um, can, can be related to the over, an oversaturation of the market uh, in terms of too many people wanting to become journalists and not being there, out there enough positions for journalists. One of the reasons is, yeah, young people, is very common for young people to want to become journalists, uh, but also this has to do with a new, new, relatively new way of training journalists. In the past, journalists were starting to work by starting to work. I mean, working, going to a newsroom and starting to work there, uh, literally, the first day of, of work would be the first day they try to be journalists. Now, with all these training, training courses in uh, universities or um, high, higher education institutions, uh, there are more and more people becoming you know, trained to be journalists, but not really already into one uh, media organization. So that, uh, that is increasing the number of wannabe journalists without a position. The other reason these studies point out is academic cutbacks, which, of course, for us, we can immediately think about the financial crisis. Um, but actually, the problem, uh, I mean, the, 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 the economic cutbacks started before the financial crisis. So um, already before, because of the con conglomeration of the media, uh, there is a tendency, there has been a tendency tendency in media companies to slim down the newsrooms as, as much as possible and to relocate or, I mean, um, assign uh, part of the news production outside because, of course, this makes, uh, gives more flexibility to the media companies, uh, allows them to, to spend less money, and so it's obviously uh, a good thing for them. Um, when we look at the fr Chinese freelance journalists, um, the reason why, well, there is, like I said, the reason why I started to study them was because it was very surprising to me to find that freelancers existed in China. Uh, but the reason why there are other <laughs> good reasons to study Chinese freelancers, and again, they have to do with quantity, so they as well have increased massively, uh, I should say, uh, in China because uh, well, these figures that I, that I wrote down, they come from a handbook for freelance journalists, a Chinese handbook, I mean, written in Chinese for Chinese wannabe freelancers. It was published in 2003. Unfortunately, these are the only data that I could find, so, and I have no idea how reliable they are because the author is a journalist, but he doesn't claim what the source is, so anyway, take them for what they are. Um, I don't know how, how true they are. Um, what, is, what is interesting, I mean, what is um, the only thing that is sure is that freelance journalists did not exist in China before the 90s at least uh, because um, in the People's Republic of China the system, uh, not just the media system but the work, the working system, uh, the labor market let's say, was organized in a way that there couldn't be anyone working outside a working unit. A work unit at Dong Wei um, is, so if uh, any Chinese had to have would be assigned a position in a work unit. They would, have, they would keep this position normally for the whole life. Sometimes they would change it, but the most likely situation would be that they would keep the position for the whole life. And anyone who wouldn't have a position in a work unit or wouldn't have anyone in the family in a work unit basically would not exist because the work unit provided not just work but also social assistance, I mean health, health, um, health uh, insurance, um, education for the children and, and so on. So the whole life was related to the down way. Now in this situation you can imagine how unthinkable it is to even, I mean how impossible it is to even think of being a freelancer, not just as a journalist, just in any other industry. So this was a very new uh, situation that started to develop with the opening up of China after the 1978, the 80s. Uh, in the media sector, uh, this possibility 
to work freely, I mean independently, uh, became possible at the end of the 90s. Um, the position of journalists, freelancers, is even more interesting because of the type of industry they are in. Uh, because uh, journalists in China are assigned officially a role, they have a duty, let's say. So the party assigns them the role to be hou shi, throat and tongue, so yeah, loudspeakers, let's say, of the party polities. They also have another duty, I didn't write it here, they also have the duty to, I mean, officially, of course, in theory, they have the duty to represent the people as well. So they have two duties, represent the people and represent the party. But these, the, the fact that they have to represent the party puts, uh, I mean, the journalist who works in a, in a newsroom in a, uh, in a position that uh, requires uh, a, some control. And this control, uh, so there is this theoretical uh, definition of, of this duty that they have to be certain tongue. Um, the way, the, way let's, the system uh, controls that the journalists carry out, these, carry out the, the job in re respecting this uh, duty, uh, mainly two ways. Of course, it's more, diff it's more um, complicated than this, but uh, in, there is a, a professional control uh, uh, because journalists, professional journalists, uh, can work if they have a journalist card. Uh, you, can ask, you can access uh, uh, some interviewees, for instance politicians, but also many uh, officials, only if you have a journalist card. To get the journalist card in China as a Chinese, you have to work in an organization, in an official media organization, as a stable employee. So, of course, freelance journalists do not have a journalist card. The journalist card also to be so you, you can get the card uh, with an exam after you've worked in a news organization and then to keep your card you have to go through uh, regular trainings or tests that also have a political flavor to them. Uh, the other way, so this is like, let's say, the professional, the control on, on, the, on the professional, uh, on the career, let's say, of a journalist. The other way, uh, the other, yeah, the other way to control the, the, the journalists carry out their duty in the proper way is the existence of the propaganda department. Uh, there, there is, I mean, the propaganda depart department exists at a central level and then it exists at local levels. Any journalist working in a newsroom, maybe not directly because it, 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 it all goes down to the hierarchy. So, of course, the journalists with the top position in, in the newsroom will be the ones actually dealing with the, with the people of the local propaganda department. But anyway, there will be a, a top-down uh, control in a way. And, and newsrooms always have a dialogue with the propaganda department, the local propaganda department, which you know, gives instruction or advice on what can be reported, how to report on some things, and so on. So anyway, in this, this is what, what I want to point out is that a journalist working in a newsroom is including in this system, which is somehow, in theory, controlled. This is still true even um, if, in the 1978, the media reform um, started, was launched, um, together with all the other final economic uh, reforms of the uh, opening up of China. Um, the media reform, like the other reform, started as a financial, I mean, an economic reform. So the, the, the goal of the reform was to change uh, the financing system of media organizations because up to then uh, all papers, TVs, radios, anything were uh, supported with public funding. So the state basically decided we don't want to give money to news organizations anymore. They have to support themselves, the most of them, not all of them. For instance, Xinhua News Agency, People's Daily and others are all still funded by, by the state. But to, uh, to, I mean, the, 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 main, the, main, the majority of news organizations had to start to rely on themselves. So that changed, I mean, that, that meant a revolution of mindset in a way, because up until then, what was the most important thing that a journalist and a newsroom had to have in their mind was the, po the, the, the pol um, politics. So to respect politics, represent political views, and so on. Now, what they need, it, from now, from then to now, what they need to, to think about is uh, selling, selling advertisement, uh, selling the paper to the readers. So they had to change the style, they had to change the topics they, they cover, so less 
political um, stories and more uh, fresh and, and more and stories closer to the citizens. Um, these uh, also gener so new types of articles, new genre of articles developed, and I'm pointing out just this one, without, which I'm going to. Uh, make a reference again about later. The commentary on current affairs shipping is, is a type of article which expresses, okay, is, the, is like an editorial uh, or like a column in a way, more than an editorial, because it's, a, it's, a, it's an article that is signed by the author, so the author is known. Uh, it's a comment, and it's a comment about something that is happening, that happened just very recently. So it's, it's a commentary on uh, social problems, something very fresh anyway, which um, became particularly popular, uh, especially from the 90s. Okay, in my research, these are the, the questions that I asked myself. Uh, I'll try to answer to some of them. Um, well, first of all, my, my main question was how freelance journalists could even start, or why did they start to appear in a system that was before so regulated in, by work units? Um, the other question is how do they represent themselves? How do they talk about themselves? Uh, in terms of activities, so the daily routine, uh, what they do, uh, but also what is the motivation? Why did, why did I decide to become freelance journalist? And what is the mission they, they, they think they have? Um, and finally, what is the perception that they have about the free part of the, the name freelancer? I mean, uh, there is one word which is used to translate the concept of freelancers, freelance journalists in China which is Zuyo Jankaren, which has Zuyo, which means free. So they also have this word. It is not, absolutely not the only word they use to, tra to translate this uh, concept. But anyway, uh, the, the question was where, whether and where do they see the freedom in their activity? Uh, just very briefly, the way the research was conducted was um, with the interviews, qualitative semi-structured interviews, uh, two Chinese freelance journalists, uh, to some media professionals, so journalists working in newsrooms, uh, and media experts, all Chinese. Uh, like I said, I started in 2008, and then I, I'm conti I've, I've continued. I mean, um, I just came back from China last Friday, so I, my last interview was on Thursday, or not Wednesday. Um, also, the research is about, uh, it was carried out, I mean, it started with uh, studying handbooks for freelancers, just to understand how Chinese talk about this, this, um, this phenomenon, and also my personal experience in the, in the paper. Okay, so um, I'm going to, I, I did just quote some, some of the interviewees, they are all anonymized, because they have to be anonymized in my research, um, maybe you will understand why. Um, but EXP stands for expert, so media expert, this is not a journalist talking, when you will see FR, it's a freelancer. Um, I'm not going to read all the quotes, but um, so how did freelancer appear? Some of the reasons that I was given were related to commercialization of the media. Like I said, 1978, media reform means commercialization of the media, translating to commercialization of the media. Um, so what after, after the, the reform began, Chinese paper could start to get people from outside involved in their operations. Um, so when... In originally, there were not too many spaces for writing, for publishing. Now, there are many more spaces. And what commercial commercialization did was to shift the attention of newsrooms, like I said, to the taste of the readers more than to political um, uh, reasons. Um, okay. um, and what some interviewees pointed out is that two types of articles were particularly um, interesting and important, I mean, um, liked by the public, entertainment articles and commentaries on comment affairs that I mentioned before. Other reason for uh, the appearance of freelancers is because freelance journalists, Chinese freelancers are more specialized and more skilled to, in order to write these type of articles than the, the journalists working in newsrooms. Journalists in newsrooms usually are not able to write commentaries, um, to comment on diverse news, you need writers who are specialists on different disciplines. Freelancers have different skills and resources. We widen the possibilities of papers for which we work. Um, the internet as well played a very important role. Uh, the appearance of the internet and the, and the blooming of the internet in China um, paid, um, uh, played a very important role uh, because online 
uh, is where many freelancers started to publish uh, on blogs, on, on BBS. Um, that's also where the newsrooms found them. So uh, some, some freelance journalists started to publish like I said, freely and independently, like open the blog, started to publish opinions, for instance, and then newsrooms, uh, journalists working in newsrooms, looking for people to write commentaries, looked for them online and found them, and that's how they started to publish for the print. Um, about the life, about the life and production, you can see what they do, I mean, the way they describe themselves is pretty much how, I guess, any freelancer uh, would represent themselves in the West as well, so they work from home, and or in the spare time. Some of them, in fact, have another job. Um, they work for more than one media company normally. Uh, they have a, bro a blog or a microblog that they use to uh, you know, uh, enhance their uh, popularity as well. Uh, it, well, this is more specific to China. It's more interesting. I was interesting to see whether they write for party papers or commercial papers. They do write for both of them. For party papers, they do not write commentaries. So if they write for, part, for party papers, uh, basically they write entertainment features or other, yeah, this type, mainly, mainly entertainment or cultural articles, but it's very, I, I didn't find anyone uh, writing editorials for them. Uh, this is instead very specific to China, so they don't write hard news. The reason why they don't write hard news is because they don't have a journalist card, or this is the reason they gave me at least. Uh, so like I said, the group of people that I interviewed basically can be uh, broken down in two groups. So the writers of entertainment features and the writers of, of commentaries. Um, when asked about the motivations or why they became freelancers, um, two sets of, of motivations. One is personal benefit, personal, uh, yeah, gaining personal benefit. That is, for instance, doing something, doing what you like, so doing something interesting, following, following my interests. Um, so, for instance, if a paper asks me to write an article on a topic I'm not interested in, it, I turn the offer down. Um, the other set of motivation has to do with uh, self-expression, um, so of, to do with the possibility of expressing opinion and, and your own mind. Uh, speak your mind, tell my opinion, express myself. Um, mission, uh, it represents, it mirrors the motivations that they, that they claim they have. So we have those who um, basically want to, you know, uh, enjoy the job because they know that people will enjoy what they, what they, what they write. And uh, the other group that says, uh, the, the one that they have a social, more social engagement, so the ones who express opinions and they want to speak their mind, they say they have um, uh, a role of public intellectual, represent the people and influence the government. Um, so, I mean, when asked about the freedom, uh, they all uh, agreed that, yes, they obviously have autonomy when it comes to organization of their own life and of their daily routine. So, uh, you know, they decide what time they get to get up, they can go swimming whenever they want, they choose what to write, they decide how often they, have, they can have another occupation, and they have no ties with one single publisher. When asked about content instead, the, uh, the, 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 um, the answers were obviously more... Um, clear-cut. Um, so all the interviewees, and I'm talking especially about the ones who write commentaries because this question is more relevant for those who express opinions, um, they say they're all aware of the boundaries that they have to face. Uh, they say we can dance but we have wrists and ankles tied. Uh, we don't know in advance when our articles will be changed because sometimes it happens that they send the article to the, to the newsroom, the article will be changed significantly sometimes, they will not know in advance, they will find out when it's on the paper. Um, but, you know, because they say we are aware of the boundaries, we know we have to respect them. On the other hand, they also say, they also claim that they have uh, creative ways to get around boundaries, uh, they have strategies that they use, they write in an artistic way, they choose the words they use in order to express what they want to say, that's what they claim, without um, incurring into censorship or, or I mean, any sort of blockage. Um, so the more optimistic, the most optimistic that I, that I spoke to said, I, I feel very optimistic. Um, Chinese media are opening up slowly, but they are. They, in the inter on the internet, the control is more and more relaxed. Um, so even if they shut down your blog because you published something that you shouldn't have published, 
someone else, somewhere else online will be able to speak their mind as well. So that space for the opinions remains. Or does it not? Because all these interviews um, are, uh, all these quotes that I put out are, um, um, were, were conducted before 2010. And uh, like I said, I just came back from China and I did interviews also in 2014. Um, the, this, the landscape is changing really quickly. Um, we have, I know, I'm just gonna take another two minutes. Um, the interviews, the interviewees I talked to, some of them were the same interviewees that I spoke to in 2008 and 2009, so same person, but ch they changed the point of view. One thing is that uh, there is a pre-media crisis in China, they say, as well, just like in, in the West, so uh, less uh, chances to actually write for the press. Um, fees that are shrinking, and so less motivation for freelancers to actually write. Um, uh, not going to talk about public intellectuals, um, and there is, they say, a tighter control on all media, not just print media, also the internet, um, and also microblog. They say under the new leadership, um, the, the control has been tightened significantly. So the, 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 the results that I, the, the question whether freelance journalists are still a, a phenomenon that is important to study has to be, has to be asked again. Some of the interviewees believe that the number of freelancers is, is shrinking, is reducing in China. So unlike in the West, the crisis has actually, is actually producing more freelancers. In China, they say that the, the crisis is actually pr producing less freelancers. Um, some others uh, believe that actually the number of freelancers is stable. And the reason why it's stable is because some people work for a year or two, then they quit, then they start again. Um, and the, the most interesting uh, reason why they believe that the number is actually stable or even increasing is something that I will research on uh, in the future and has to do with the um, entrepreneurial uh, attitude that some Chinese freelancers are starting to have. So they are setting, I don't know exactly how, their own companies uh, on new media, so online. And uh, this is one way. The other way is WeChat. WeChat is, um, Gianluigi spoke about it just briefly, so it's the, uh, the same as WhatsApp is in China, but it's not the same, has many more features, many more um, uh, properties. And one uh, key uh, function that it has is the Gung Hao, is the possibility to broadcast your articles, material, pictures, whatever you want, to the whole public. You don't need to just, the people who read you just need to follow you. You don't need to link, I mean, you don't need to be their friends uh, or to accept their, their, um, their, 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 their following. Um, so WeChat is the, it's appearing to be the new platform for freelance journalists as well uh, to use. And I'll finish. Thank you. Sorry for the. Thanks, Emma. <laughs> and, uh, so uh, now we will open to our QA session and anyone has any question you can raise up your hands and we will listen to you if there's any yes please thank you Farida Nexot, uh, journalist from Afghanistan I just uh, here watch uh, there's still not a uh, media law in uh, China is it right so how do you control the media? In, in my perspective, if there is no mass media law, they control, uh, or in case they criticize the government, they will shut uh, up the organization or website. So, and which procedure they want to take decision, what is, uh, it means the press freedom. And China, I think it will be a problem for journalists. Um, I think you, you address this question to for the, for the to book. any one of us, or just we can give you Maybe answers. Yes, if we just uh, because uh, sorry, the name I Emma. Uh, I just uh, see a okay. presentation of her. Maybe if she has the experience as a. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.
for the, so you want to understand if there is a media law in China for news organizations? Uh, Sorry, because I couldn't hear no, She wants to understand, like, well, I can't explain yeah. a little bit, you can okay, help so later. Uh, yes, we, in China still there is no law published about the media system, but we have different regulations on different media sector on different levels. So different media organizations, they will follow those regulations published by different administration. So, and also actually the discussion of the media law in China has been gone through many, many years. I think starting already from 1980s or 90s. It's just this discussion didn't finish yet and they, want, they are still preparing the real law to be published one day. But they are, re they are regulations, so they were still under certain well control and also and also actually in recent years uh, somehow the government tried to give more freedom more space for different sectors media especially for those entertainment media if you are not like news organization you enjoy really much more freedom than other media organization and maybe someone can second and just a word is a, a problem that characterizes the whole chinese system because there is this kind of distinction between rule of law and rule by law and the fact that the chinese government has not a media law it led to uh, of course, go, sen somehow censor and monitor better the some behavior of uh, of, uh, of journalists, but also internet users. Indeed, one of the most uh, and Jan uh, Jan mentioned during the presentation of the most one of the most important trend that characterized China's journalism: the how to censorship, which took place not only in uh, newspapers, as uh, Emma said, but also in for normal people characterized the behavior, online behavior of a lot of Chinese internet users. Yeah, I mean, the main problem that journalists point out in China when you talk to them about limitations and so on is the fact that there is no law on journalism, so they don't know where the boundaries are exactly. One day they cannot talk about something, one day it's, it's acceptable to, to talk about the same thing. So they don't know when the, the limitations change. It's very unclear to them, and that's why they have, they all, the, most of the time they rely on, on self-censorship, because that's the safest way. So it, it also has to do with their own perception is just a very, you know, yeah, individual and subjective perception of how the situation is. And that is the reason why sometimes some journalists are, end up in jail and sometimes they don't because the limitations are not clear. Thank you. And uh, yeah, we may only have time for another one or two questions. So one question. take your time. <laughs> yeah. If anyone interested to know something more. And now, if okay. no other you scared them all. <laughs> yeah, maybe I can ask one small question yeah, for so, Emma. Yeah. I just want to say, the freelancers in China, I mean, when they, uh, when they sell their stories, according to you, they were more testing the boundaries to, to push a little bit more uh, further, or they try to limit themselves to sell better, according to your understanding? Um, I think, okay. <sighs> Uh, some will will try to. Some will say I'm not interested in uh, actually expressing anything that can be any any even remotely sensitive. Um, some of them will actually try to push the boundaries. Those who were trying to push the boundaries, and I spoke to in 2008 and uh, basically most of them they told me that that don't don't work as freelancers anymore now because they they say we we know that we cannot write as much as we wanted, and now we just prefer not to write. Uh, so. Okay, One thing to add about the, the general problem situation of Chinese uh, environment is that probably in this face, this one of the most I would say liberal uh, newspapers is Nanfan Jomo is facing a crisis in terms of not only from economic political pressure but also for the economic goals and uh, yeah the general situation that is going to probably uh, decrease the number of, free, we don't know, we have no magic ball, but we cannot make, make this kind of prediction, is the problem of freelance will have some problems in the near future with the... Yeah, non Fanjo mode, Southern Weekend, uh, Southern Weekly, um, was one of the main outlets for opinions, for outspoken opinions uh, and editorials in China. The people I spoke to just recently, they told me uh, they don't write anymore for non Fanjo Mo because that's not a place where you can put outspoken opinions anymore. So they use Beijing papers, other, other papers. 
last minute for self-promotion yeah. about so uh, our we, activities. We, we have like two promotions for some uh, activities based in uh, China Media Observatory and also Mianan University. Uh, we are organizing a summer school from last year uh, in cooperation with Peking University in China. And it's a summer school project. We gather together both European scholars and Chinese scholars as well as European media experts with Chinese experts to deep together just contemporary issues regarding to the Chinese media industry as well as European media industry. So if any one of you or, or like your colleagues or students, friends, you think might be interested in this program, you can try to contact us and we can give you more details to follow up. As for Milan instead, excuse me, just 30 seconds. We are organizing a conference on 27, 28 of May. If you're interested in topics related to media and politics, not just China, all over the world, there is this conference, it's just free, so you can just come to Milano and, and follow it. So if you're interested, just we, we, we can, I don't know, get in touch. But anyway, it's about media and politics, and there will be China, Arab, Russia, uh, you know, media from all over the world. Thank you. Okay, one last word, uh, another promotion. We will also organize an international conference in Coventry University uh, in the first uh, June, uh, talk about open media uh, around the world. So is there anything you want to much more further details, could talk to me. Thank you very much. I guess the Thanks. time is over. Thank you for your attention to be here, and uh, we are open to discuss uh, outside of them. Thank you. Thank you.